Um, I'm Mandy from Liverpool John Moores. Um, we, uh, we spoke extensively last year on what we'd done and we'll speak a little bit today on, on what we've done next. Um, and I want to introduce my kind of silent partner, not so silent partner, Mark, uh, who works with me a lot in the background to, to get things done and to find ways forward of, of doing things. Yes, it's my job at the agency to, um, well, to really educate our agency, our account management team, on how best to engage with, with clients like uh, LGMU, um, and also to help LGMU on how to engage with us in, as an agency to get the most value uh, out of what we can, what we can offer. Um, I will say that uh, Mandy decided about three minutes ago to say that the last person she presented with left their job a week later, so I'm not entirely sure how this is going to pan out. The last supplier left and went to a different, completely different sector, but, you know, just trying to keep you on your toes there, Mark. <laughs> Shot across the valves. Yeah. So, uh, this is a lovely map. You can s well, was a lovely map. It was a lovely map. You can see on there that... Um, just next to what we lovingly call Paddy's Wigwam, uh, which is the spiky building or the Catholic Cathedral, is Mando's office. Um, the building that looks like a cheese grater is the one that you're sat in now, and, and we work about half a mile away from that, so um, Mando are very close to us, both in heart and uh, in geography. Okay. So we thought we'd do a bit of a recap on the journey so far. I know that um, there are a lot of new people here today. So Greenwich's presentation earlier on in the conference, which shared the pain of going through a really fast implementation, a really fast turnaround, was what we did uh, a year ago. So we, we rebooted the web team. We went from what we called a web team, which is a banned word in our office, to a digital services um, department. Um, and we put lots of partnership agreements in place. That was with external providers and our internal clients as well. So we, we don't work in marketing. We're placed outside of marketing and outside of IT. And we have a partnership agreement with marketing that says what they're going to do, what their responsibilities are, what our responsibilities are, and what are the benefits of us working together, just so that we can wave that piece of paper if ever we forget or get, get too uh, far over those boundaries. Um, I suppose in the last year we've shifted from uh, getting things live and getting the content on there to really starting to dig into the, well, what is it we're trying to achieve? Um, this is all about the user experience. It's always been about the user experience, but there were some things, um, I think I like the analogy of putting the sheet down before you play in the sandpit. We were busy putting the sheet down, now we're playing in the sandpit. Um, we've defined a, a departmental blueprint and that goes not just across digital services but also across business systems as well. And we've moved from a panic mode of uh, after going live to, oh it's broke, we need to fix it, to, okay I don't want to spend my money on that anymore, how are we going to innovate and how are we going to move forward. Uh, and I think in the university we're now seen as a solutions team. Uh, which is great, but it's also difficult because it means that everyone's knocking on the door to get stuff done and we have limited resources, limited budgets, and we don't like saying no. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, and that's a perspective from Mandy as an internal person within LJMU. Of course, as an external supplier to LJMU, our perspective on the situation was, was similar but, but different. Um, I remember my, my first experience, or one of my first experiences with LJMU two and a half years ago, we were sat in our boardroom, um, and you imagine that the boardroom table was a, was a big long table, I was sat at the head of the table as the only person from Mando in the room, um, and there were about 12 people from LJMU, one team sat on the left hand side of the table, uh, one team sat on the on the right hand uh, side of the table. I wasn't there, by the way. This is, this is pre-Mandy. Uh, pre -Mandy. Um, um, the, the teams were, were, were debating, um, nicely speaking, um, about uh, an, an integration that they had between their application and, and, and their application. Um, and it, it was almost a full-blown argument. It was quite a surreal situation for somebody working in an agency to be sitting and, and mediating almost as a, as a marriage counsellor between two teams within uh, an, an external client's uh, business. Um, and, and that's where we were. We were supporting legacy systems. LJMU was supporting legacy systems, um, and, they, and they got into this situation. 
Um, then came the technology refresh, LGMU purchase, Sitecore uh, content management system, um, and we worked with them for about 12 months, putting that in as a, as a commodity build partner. We got paid a day rate to cut code and produce templates and uh, build a website effectively. Um, we helped them to, to set the vision for digital. We helped them to understand what roles they needed in their, in, in their team. We worked closely with Mandy on that. Um, and we helped them to define release uh, deployment processes, which are really important to increase quality and to maintain quality, which is something that you, you often find lacking in a, in, in a client's uh, environment. Um, and then in the last 12 months, we've, um, we've seen that transition. As Mandy said, we've we put the sheet down and, and now we're playing in the, uh, in, in the sandpit and have gone from being a functional partner to more of a value-add business partner. That actually means less revenue, actually considerable less revenue for us as an agency, um, but actually far more strategic, innovative and exciting projects to be, to be working on. Um, and we can, we can summarise our, our relationship or the, the client agency relationship in uh, one way we can visualise it is, is in an org chart. Um, so this is the, the LJMU team, which, uh, which Mandy will talk about. So um, I run Corporate Business Change Initiatives, which is a big long title for um, solving problems really. And we've got a program office with a, a project manager and a project support officer, the business systems team that runs HR, payroll, finance and student finance and digital services. And my kind of aim is to get them all working very nicely together and, and that's, that's paying off, we're doing really well with that. Um, it's a relatively small team in digital services. We've got, um, at the moment, five developers, one contract. We've got two support and admin posts. We've got uh, three or four content coordinators, depending on what's going on, and a vacant post for a UX designer that we've been trying to get through our internal systems for the last 15 months now, and which, actually, one of the things that Mando helped with is plugging our gaps where we do have those vacant posts. Yeah, uh, I mean, pl plugging the gaps is certainly one area where we can help. I think one of the other benefits that you get from uh, working with a partner is is the uh, extra roles that are made available to, to, to Mandy's team. Um, so we're, we're a 50-man agency. We have roles from discovery de design through to development, build, and, and support. Um, and they're fronted by an account manager and project manager um, who are tasked with working with, with Mandy and Dom and the team to make the best use of the people that are available within the agency. So what we've got is three case studies, three projects that we've worked on which we think are um, innovative um, and, and exciting. Um, and we're going to demonstrate how uh, we've used different roles within the agency to deliver um, each of those projects. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is digital workspace or digital workplace. So if you read any of Microsoft blogs or if you go to any Microsoft conferences, I'll tell you that the Workplace is no longer the place we go to work, but it's the systems and devices and interfaces and processes that we use to connect and collaborate with, uh, with our colleagues. Um, that's a very utopian, idealistic scenario. I'm sure that uh, you know, if we fast forward five years, we might all be wearing Google Glass and, and, and Apple Watches and uh, uh, using HoloLens to, to work and, and have meetings with each other, but it's, it's not really the case now. What, what we do know, though, is that by um, using digital to make your internal teams and your employees more operationally effective and more productive and more collaborative, that it actually benefits and adds a lot of value, uh, a lot of percentage points value onto the work that you're doing with your digital student uh, initiatives. Okay, so uh, digital workspace for us, uh, and I've recognised through some of the presentations um, here in the last couple of days, we've done the, we ticked the box that said we've got a new external website. The vice chancellor was happy, we had a new window to the world, and then I said, okay, phase two, students and staff, current experience, let's sort that out, and, and you get the, okay, off you go, go away quietly and get on with that. Well, where's the checkbook that I had last year? Uh, we'll see what you can do with what you've got. So um, the digital workspace project is, is one that's really close to my heart because it has the biggest impact. We've got 28,000 internal clients. And my vision for our digital workspace is to basically save an hour a day. So whether it's a study day or a working day, that's the vision. And I think we can do that easily by integrating our systems better by making things more personalized and if you consider that as part of the cost to the university you you know take an hour's salary off everybody and work out what that is that's got to be worth some investment so 
We had done a lot of work around this. We started with a staff workspace and a student workspace. We decided there was probably an 80% overlap so that we put them together. Um, we've done some, some research with internal clients, with our internal teams, with legal, with, with lots of different teams to understand what their services are. And, and that's an interesting concept to try and get them to think about the user experience and what user stories are. But also with staff and students as users as well. Um, and what that gave us was a whole pile of information uh, that we could refine down and say, well, these are the top tasks. These are the things that, that are going to kill it. But we've got, as Mark said before, quite a lot of legacy systems. We've got some new platforms. And really, what I wanted Mando to do in, to help us with, the, with this was not to come in and do it for us. We can do it ourselves. But actually, I wanted them to be a sounding board for me and the team so that we could play back where we think we're going, what the direction is, and almost say, are we on the right track here? Because we don't want to make any big mistakes. Uh, you know, we're happy to make small ones and keep learning and keep failing and all of that. But actually, when it comes to some big decisions, we just want some validity. Um, so that's why we got Mando involved. Yeah. Um uh, coming back to our old chart, what that looked like from a, an engagement perspective, um, the conversation happened in, initially between myself, Mandy, and our account manager, Lady. Um, Mandy relayed what it was that she was trying to achieve, both from a business objectives perspective, but also from a technical and technology integration perspective. Um, and we, we looked at the technologies involved and the use cases involved, and we were able to identify one person within our agency who had worked with all those technologies and was certified in those technologies and also delivered some very similar uh, projects. So we, we used him as a consultant um, only for uh, a couple of days, like certainly less than a week, to help soundboard and, and validate those, uh, those, those ideas that Mandy had had um, and the, the, the solution design that, that Mandy had put together. Um, there's a guy called Gary Pretty. Um, I have this thing where I have to humiliate a colleague in every single presentation I do. Uh, I mean, he looks so happy, doesn't he? He's uh, been to Disneyland 21 times and he doesn't have children. Um, can you believe that? Um, but Gary was the right man for the job and, and, and um, Mandy got what she needed from us. Um, and I guess the point there, there's two points really. One, it doesn't have to cost the earth engaging with, a, with an agency or a partner. Um, but secondly, whilst we are a business and we're a collection of people with a website and a portfolio and a bunch of case studies, actually the gold nuggets are sometimes found within the individuals and their, their own experience. So you have to be able to trust that your account manager understands the people in the agency, understands what projects they've worked on, what their skills are, what their expertise are, uh, and, and, and can match it to the right uh, the right. Uh, the second project we're going to talk about is around location-based targeting. So you, you're all probably familiar with iBeacons. Has anybody not heard of, of iBeacons? Great. Um, so iBeacons are a, are a physical device that you stick on a wall in a physical location and when a user uh, comes into the proximity of that beacon with your mobile app, it detects uh, where they are and it's able to deliver personalised uh, messages to them based on, based on their location. Um, I read a stat this week that there are, there are going to be over 400 million iBeacons in production use by, by 2018. Um, you know, this isn't a fad anymore. Two years ago it was a fad, um, now it's, it's getting serious. And it, obviously it's big in retail, retailers are talking about it a lot, but we're starting to see a lot more use cases where actually beacons and location-based targeting can be used in um, uh, other situations such as, as higher education. So we, um, we were fiddling about with iBeacons and we obviously want to use them for our, our um, student events and staff events and things like that but we thought that was a little bit high risk to have a play around with so um, estates turned up and asked me if we could find a better way to get feedback from students and how we how they engaged with students in the cafe areas and I said oh actually let me have a little think about it um, why don't we do some kind of incentives and then we can measure a, whether how the technology works, how the hardware and the software works, but also measure the student engagement. So how many people are downloading the app? How many people delete it without using a voucher? What, what do those voucher sales look like on your bottom line? Um, and we picked one particular cafe 
and we picked a quiet time of year because we, you know, we didn't want to skew it in any way. And uh, we did a six-week trial where we stuck the eye beacons up and we, we measured, basically. So we got some really good analytics to tell us how people were using them, what, what traffic, uh, how they were passing through different parts of the building. And that's enabled us now to make some decisions about how we want to use this technology moving forward. But also, what Gary and I quite often do is get in a room together for three hours and blue sky think till it's coming out of our ears. And, and the next project we're going to do with iBeacons is to, um, to do some wayfinding stuff. So uh, it's actually a, it's a lower level. It's not a full beacon. It's actually a, a strip, if you like, in terms of tech. But we are having some major office moves. We're moving 450 staff from three buildings into one. And we're going to build an app that, um, because it's quite a complicated building, that helps our staff get around that building in the first few weeks. Uh, again, using our staff is, is low risk. We might want to use it for students at induction uh, further down the line, but we're, we're not quite there yet. So this little project that was co-funded because I went, when I went to Mando with this idea, they said, oh, great. And I said, have you done it before? And they said, no. And I said, OK, so how much money are you going to put into it? And we had a, a debate and a, and a conversation about budgets. And we agreed that as a partnership, we'd do it together. Uh, because I'm quite you know, careful with my money. I don't want to pay somebody to develop something they've not done before. I wanted to split the risk. Uh, so that's been a, a partnership that's that's really worked for us. It's really worked for the university, and uh, and that we'll both get some um, some good learning out of. Yeah, and equally from our perspective, having a client willing to cover our costs for a real kind of cutting edge innovation led project is, is like a dream come true. So cover half your costs. <laughs> no, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll half our rate. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's great. It's testing to the relationship, but what I would say is if you are working with agencies, then don't be afraid to, to ask that kind of question when working on those two projects. Um, so again, coming back to the org chart, the roles that were involved in that project, uh, and of course we had an account manager and a project manager, um, the app had to be designed, it had to be developed. Uh, we needed a marketing manager to get back some of our, our, our margins um, through uh, publicising the project through, uh, through our, our marketing channels. Um, but again, um, only using a, a real small subset of, of the agency and, and, and the roles uh, available. The, the third project, um, we talk about the personalization. I uh, won't labor the fact too much because Piero covered it really well in, uh, in his presentation. Um, I think the one thing that I would say is, is probably 10 years ago, um, we all thought that personalization was exclusive to, to Amazon. Um, five years ago, we, we probably all felt it was exclusive to, to retailers and e-commerce stores. Um, I think uh, in today's world, uh, not doing personalization actually risks delivering a suboptimal experience or even a, a poor disengaging experience, even in higher education. Um, so the, the, the two barriers, um, again, as Piero touched on, uh, to, to get started with personalization, first of all, you've got to have the technology, you've got to have something that can actually drive the personalization for you. Um, and secondly, you've got to know where to start. Uh, there's no point in just um, going and personalizing components left, right, and center on your website because it'll get very, very messy very quickly um, and it will be very, very ineffective. Um, and for most of the conversations that I have with, with clients, it, it, it is we, we just don't know where to start. I think from our point of view, we'd, uh, we'd put the basics in place and we wanted to always optimize. So we have this module, uh, we weren't quite sure what to do with it. Personalization is really, really difficult, and, and, and you know it's great for people to stand up here and talk about it. But actually, for me, it's more segmentation than personalization because there's so many things that have to be lined up underneath to make this work. But we wanted to explore that, and we've spent quite a bit of time with colleagues at Mando to really try and understand our own markets, to really try and understand what it is we want to achieve from it. And again, just take some really small little projects that help us get along that way, um, give the team some confidence about how we're using the product, give the wider team in terms of our marketing and student recruitment colleagues some confidence as well, and then take that forward. Yeah, so we, um, we on the back of Mando's requirements, uh, created a it's a product called the DMS Starter Kit, which was designed for people using Cycle, but uh, not using personalization parts of it. 
um, which is a little bit like buying a Ferrari and driving to the shops. Um, so we, we created this, this product, but similarly to the way we co funded the IB project, uh, LJMU helped us to work with us to create this product, to refine it, to deliver it, um, and, and, and again, um, pay for some of it, which, uh, which, which is fantastic and testing to the engagement between the, you know, the, the two parties. Um, coming back to our old chart again, um, actually, that's probably the, the fewest roles that we would have seen across all those three projects. There was an account manager involved. And was a solutions consultant who uh, was a cyborg consultant. Yes. It's back on time. <laughs> um, so again, you know, in, in terms of um, the engagement, not not costing the earth. Um, which brings us on to our key takeaways. Mm -hmm. So I think from from my point of view. Um, I, I deal with lots of suppliers. I think I have 45 supplier relationships over, di over all the different systems. And I don't view them as supplier relationships. I definitely view them as, as partnerships. And like any relationship, uh, they all take work and investment of time. But it's not just about saying, well, how's it gone this month? Is, is everything OK? It's about what are we doing over the next 6, 12, 18 months? How are we going to optimise what we're doing? And from my point of view, I want us to be at the not the bleeding edge, but certainly the leading edge of, of what we're doing in digital. Um, misunderstandings can and do occur. We have each other on speed dial. Um, we get together often for coffee, which is not to talk about anything specific. It's just to have a chat and see what's going on. I'm involved in a lot of um, Liverpool kind of digital networky type stuff, so I talk to lots of other agencies. It's not a, you know, a singular relationship. That sounds wrong, but anyway, um, and it's not. It isn't just commercial because uh, yes, we talk about money, but quite often that's the last thing that we discuss. Uh, it's about the ideas, it's about the innovation and where we go, and then we work out how we're going to make that work commercially. Um, each of those projects have different models, so. Um, it doesn't have to be that you have to have a 200 grand retainer to have these conversations. It could be that I'll ask for two hours of Mark's uh, staff time or I'll ask for two days, two weeks. It just depends. And quite often it comes down to what budget I've got. So I'll say to Mark, I want this. And he'll say, that'll cost this much. And I'll laugh. And then we have a conversation about how, how much we're actually going to pay. And, and that really works, you know, works for us. Um, but also... What Mando have given us is, is uh, access to their network as well. So we go along to their events. We network with Warburton's and Robinson's Brewery and lots of um, pets at home, lots of different suppliers that use Mando. So we get a different perspective on things. We're not just looking at the higher education sector. We're always looking outside as well. Perfect. Um, I'm, I'm learning so much, by the way, from this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my key takeaways from an agency's perspective, um, the first one is make sure you work with an agency who has a vision to add value outside of getting paid. I uh, see it all the time that agencies want to take day rates and, and, and run, take the money and run. And you've got to make sure that you're getting that value back from them uh, through their ideas and through their expertise and uh, through the ROI importantly. Um, look for an agency that looks to benefit and value from your experience and expertise. So as Mandy said, we, we have Mandy speaking at our um, full leadership events. We have Mandy uh, acting as a, as a reference for us if we're talking to any prospective new clients. Um, and whenever we get a request, which happens quite a lot for a peer-to-peer -peer contact, Mandy's always the, uh, the, the first name on the list. Um, and we probably get more value from, from her than, uh, or as much value as, as you do from us. Um, noted. Um, build multifarious peer-to-peer -peer contacts. Um, we, we have a concept at, at Mando in the account management team around the difference between a diamond uh, account and a bow tie account. Uh, a bow tie account being where there's multiple people on either side funneled through a single contact, an account manager to a, a project manager, for example, between the agency and, and the clients. The risk that you're running there is if that account manager leaves, all of that knowledge, all of that experience um, will, will be lost. Um, so try to build peer to peer contacts between technical people and technical people, project managers to project managers, so on and so forth. Um, work hard to understand the skills and capability of the agency that you're working with. Um, of course, you expect your account manager to do that to a certain degree. Um, however, if you can understand the people behind that account manager and what their skills, uh, capabilities and experience are, um, that will shape your reality and your ideas in a completely different way. You'll be able to generate ideas internally and take them to the agency knowing that you've got a much better chance of it actually, uh, actually working. 
Um, and then finally, share ideas and collaborate. Um, quick question for those of you who put your hand up about when you were working with an agency. Um, when, when was the last time that that agency came in and did a, a creds pitch to you about all of the projects that they're working with, um, with other clients on? Um, I would recommend that you should get them to do that minimally annually, uh, and if possible, once every six months, because you'll be amazed at the change uh, of, of portfolio in that agency from when they pitched to you originally to where they are today. They'll be working on projects and with clients that you never even knew about and that you can gain inspiration from. You can go and meet them. You can take their ideas and contextualize them into your own world uh, in a way that you, you, you couldn't think you didn't know that information. Uh, it's very easy to, to keep that perspective of what the agency was like three years ago rather than what they are like now. Um, and get them to come in and do that creds pitch and get them to follow up with an idea session um, and be open and transparent and honest about your personal goals and ambitions and your organisational goals and ambitions. The more honest and open and transparent that you can be about that, the far greater value you'll get from any idea that they, uh, that they present back to you. Um, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, anybody have any questions? Hi, it's Marianne Kay from Digital Clarity Group. Sorry. I was wondering, Mandy, uh, I was curious, uh, when you mentioned the UX designer that you are trying to hire for 15 months, what's the main reason that it's taking so long? It's, it's purely internal. Um, so I am trying to, we, we, if you look at our last 18 month journey, we've grown from a web team of three to a team of 11 and that's still not cutting it as far as I'm concerned. So at the moment, I'm spending an awful lot of money with Mark, uh, which I don't want to spend with him. I want to, I want to build my internal team. So it's always this conversation, really, between how Mando are helping us. So I dip in and pinch his UX designer for two days a week for certain projects. But really, what I'd like to do is have that um, talent in-house, and it's being able to convince internally that that because we the university's never had that role before so you know when I've got a senior team who go well who asks the users anyway then that's my challenge to try and get them to a place to say this is a valid role it's not only a valid role it's absolutely necessary for what we want to do so that that's that's the challenge really I can add to that, add to that by the fact that we've been trying to recruit the best designers for 18 months too. It's an uh, um, incredibly difficult role to, to recruit for, uh, particularly in a, in a city that's kind of hidden away, um, away from mainland England. Yeah, so if anyone wants to retrain as a UX designer, there's probably a market out there. We've got history of product design. <laughs> Top tip. Right, we show our appreciation in the usual way.